Good morning and welcome to the Archetype Pattern Workshop. Now this is a class and it's not a church nearly affiliated with a church or religious organization. This class is a non-profit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated to proving the existence of Yahweh or Elohim and the operation of the eternal pattern, purpose and plan operating throughout eternity until this present day. Now this class is a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Harry Clifford Kenley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. It incorporated several schools throughout the United States, Canada, and several, several parts of the world. Now in this class, we use and teach by the true and the original names and titles for the Father, the Word of Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been properly substituted by the Lord. The true title for the Word of Son is Elohim. It has also been properly substituted by God. And the true name for the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Now, Lord and God, they are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. We now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Now, Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. This means that Elohim is a title that our Creator chose for Himself. Now, Jesus is a name, but Jesus is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce a sound made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1,400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and original name of our Heavenly Father and His Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Now Yahweh is pure spirit and in this state is incomprehensible, inscrutable, and indiscernible. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose the cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right with himself as Elohim. This is the Word or Son, a super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. Now the shape and form could only be seen in a divine vision, and understood in a divine revelation. Later on, the self-same spirit manifests himself in a physical body and walked the earth plain as Yahshua the Messiah, who the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there's only one name given unto salvation, and we all must know this name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title could be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. Now it is called a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. Now after Yahweh fed the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and showed him a tabernacle pattern in a vision. 
Now he instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. And we go forth in this school to prove that everything in the universe operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern, and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now, the ten primary aims of this class are as follows. Number one is to help you find and know Yahweh or Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Two is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without the stakes of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. And fifth is to extirpate current superstitions, skepticism, and ignorance. Six is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. And seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by the devil, Lucifer, Satan, or in his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. And eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation of faith that was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. And ninth is to make known that Yahweh, from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man must be saved. Same in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the newer state. Our watcher is peace. Our slogan is speak the truth. Okay, this morning we have prayer by Dr. Joseph Savayos. Our scripture lesson is uh, Hebrew. It's the fourth chapter. It'll be read by Dr. Ari Ramirez. We won't have any music today because we started kind of late. And I have to set up. So, okay. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Heavenly Father, Yahweh Elohim, through the Son, Yahshua the Messiah, we are very thankful uh, that we are gathered here one more time to learn uh, about your purpose, plans, and pattern so we may be able to live the present, which is the kingdom now. We ask all these blessings in the name of your only begotten Son, Yahshua the Messiah. Let us all say, Hallelujah. 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 Good morning, class. Good morning. Good morning. I'll be reading Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and I'll be reading out of the Holy Name Bible, which contains original names and titles. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Let us therefore appear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us we were the gospel preach as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into his rest. He, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spoke in a certain place in the Sabbath on this wise, and Elohim did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth of some might enter therein, and they to whom it is first preached 
enter not because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying, In David today, after so long time, as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, hearken not your, harden not your hearts. For if Joshua the son of Nun had given them rest, then would he have not afterwards have spoken of another day. There he remaineth, therefore the keeping of the Sabbath to the people of Elohim. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as Yahweh did of his. Let us do our uppermost, therefore, to enter into the rest, lest any of any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of Yahweh is quick and, par and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piece piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrows, and is discerned of, the, of thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto his eyes of him, of whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Yahshua the son of Nun, the son of Yahweh, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. I have read Hebrews 4, chapter. Let us all say, Hallelujah. 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 Okay, once again, good morning. We're happy to be here today, and I hope you're happy to be with us. And greetings to all those that are watching from afar. Okay, our first speaker today will be Dr. Will Williams. this great and awesome, stupendous, colossal panoramic vision and revelation given to us by Yahweh I owe him. And um, uh, I had that particular scripture read for, for this reason, this one particular reason. I wanted to kind of continue a little bit what I started last week when we talked about Joshua, the son of Nun. If you would just read... Um, the scripture is uh, 4 and 8. Okay, 4 and 8. Mm -hmm. For if Joshua, the son of Nun... Speaking to the mic. So you can, so we can... Yeah, it's not working that well. All right. <laughs> For if Joshua, the son of Nun, had given them rest, then would he have not afterwards have spoken of another day. Okay. Now, if Joshua, the son of Nun, had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day, see. Right. And so now, I think in the King James Version, Right. what does that say? How, how does that read in the King James Version, if you would? I don't know, you got a Schofield. What, are, are you reading out of the King James? What yeah, you got over there, I Joe? I'm reading out of the King James. It's 4 and 8. Hebrews 4 and 8. 4 and 8. It says that, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he, not afterwards, have spoken of another day. Okay. See, in, in that book, it says Jesus. <laughs> and a lot of scholars and theologians can't think, wait a minute, Jesus had, wait a minute, we are talking about <laughs> Jesus giving them rest, you know? Exactly. You know what I'm saying? That if Jesus had given them, see, that tells you right there that even the scholars know that he was back here. Right. They just can't explain how. Okay? Correct. Now, I want to continue from what I did last week, because last week, if you remember, we uh, connected um, the two sons of Joseph, right. Ephraim and Manasseh, and showed how 
Joshua was attached to Ephraim, you know, because Jacob, when he blessed the children, he crossed his hands and put the right hand blessing on the younger, see. And, um, and personally speaking, just from a personal testimony myself, the first time I came to a class, uh, it was in January, matter of fact, 46 years ago, and it was on a Thursday. It was in the, the guy's house. He was the dean. He was Bill Farley, Jr., and it was in his living room, all right, and he only had one chart up. He had this Moses chart up, big, you know, hmm. regular-sized Moses chart in the living room, okay? Wow. And in my first session with him, he went through Joshua the son of Nun instituting and Yahshua the Messiah fulfilling. And, 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 and he kind of went into it because I, I pressed him on it because he said a couple of things in his discourse that I, I had to ask questions about. I was told when I got there I could ask questions. So I, I asked him some questions. And so he got into the thing about Joshua. And I'll tell you, when he went, and he went through it, the way it's laid out, and I think it's in the pink pamphlet and all, you know, the Joshua this, that, you know, uh, 110 years, you know, 110 and Joshua fulfilled, you know, all of that. He went through all of that with just the Moses chart, using the scriptures and, and pointing it out. And I will tell you, it thoroughly blew my mind. And really, it was the thing that convinced me about this doctrine. I mean, I had read the textbook a little bit before I even set foot in class. I had even read the preface to the Holy Name Bible before I set foot in class. So these were little steps that Yahweh was using to lead me up to this particular point so that when I did come to class, Yahweh knew exactly what to say to me to convince me. And the thing that it was, was Joshua, son of Nun, being Yahshua Messiah back here instituting, mm -hmm. Yahshua Messiah down here fulfilling. Right. And our founder, well, well yeah, he's my founder too, because he's founded this class, because mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to do this thing were it not for, the, for yeah. what the Holy Spirit would right. to one Henry Clifford Kinley. Mm -hmm. All right. He said, that, the, the, that Joshua Yahshua is the greatest mystery ever perpetrated right. upon mankind. Right. To this day, mankind truly do not understand that scripture we just read. Exactly. Yeah, the way in the King James it says, for if Jesus had given them rest, he would not have spoken. That is a mystery to them. Mm. Right. But we're going to explain it. Okay? Now, like anything, how to introduce this. And I tell people, you know, when you do lectures, and, you know, for me, and, 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 and it was reinforced by some of the film classes I took, especially this one lady who liked to make me do essays. But basically an essay or, le or lectures is a threefold thing. You have an introduction, then you have a body, then you have a conclusion, okay? Right. So now... I hope at this point I can introduce this in a way where, see, since we started this thing, Archetype Pattern Workshop, if you notice the lectures, they've been very basic, but they've been elementary to lead to a, you know, like step upon step. Because see, when we, we concentrate on certain things and certain lessons. Hopefully, in time, all these things will combine together so that you begin to see. Dr. Kinley said it best. These charts are like pieces of a puzzle. You have to learn how to put them together in a way that it makes sense. Right. Okay? And that's the problem with, with, with the Bible. See, everybody's read the Bible, mm -hmm. but don't know how to put it together in a way that makes sense. Exactly. And it's the pattern that's going to make sense. You know, help you make, you know, it's going to make you make sense, make it high. It's going to make sense for you. Okay? Now. I'm, I'm borderline pontificating here, <laughs> which is I'm dead against. So let's let's get into something. Let's introduce this, okay? Let's start with. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's try this. I, I thought about it, but let's try with Romans one nineteen and twenty. Let's start with there. Romans 1 and 19. Because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. For Yahweh has shown it unto them. 
for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and supernal nature, so that they are without excuse. Okay. Now, let's go backwards. His supernal nature, what is that? Mm -hmm. It's the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Right. Okay, that's the supernal nature. We could stretch it out and say, well, here, here's Yahweh, he's pure spirit. And he has two manifestations, an incorporeal state and a physical state. I pointed to Yahshua, but I could have easily just pointed up here. Mm -hmm. See, Or I could come over here and say the angelic creation and a physical creation. These are the two transmuted parts of pure spirit, which goes back to the other thing. He says his eternal power. His eternal power. What is his eternal power? Transmutation. His eternal power is the power of transmutation. What do you mean? It's the power he exercises. Look, these set of ages came in by transmutation. And they go out by transmutation. <laughs> and they will begin again by transmutation. So that means that transmutation is a power that Yahweh exercises eternally. Right. Okay? Now, if he has the power of transmutation, see, because this is what pure spirit is, these attributes, and matter is spirit materialized. That is to say, matter are these attributes materialized. Okay? So Yahweh created the creation. Look, first he, th these attributes had to take on shape and form first in part. Not in totality. Alright? And this is the creation. Because once this comes for Yahweh pure spirit goes out of business. Exactly. Some people say, well, Yahweh went bankrupt. That is a damn lie. <laughs> now, how about that? Yahweh did not go what did he say? Pure, he ran out of pure spirit? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. He went bankrupt. No, he went out of business. <laughs> It's like anybody, you know, if a man has a business, his son grows up, he teaches the business, here, son, here's the keys, you take over. I'm going to kick back. You run it for a while. Mm -hmm. That's what Yahweh, Yahweh, pure spirit, went out of business. And the son took over. The son fulfilled the work of the father. How? By transmuting into every cosmographical phase of the universe. That includes the angelic creation as well as the physical creation. This is the first cause of all creation right here. So it's no thing for Yahweh to be able to take on a body, okay, and walk around his creation. It's, that's not a hard trick for him to do because everything is transmuted from him. So it's, no, it's, it's, it's nothing for him to take on a body, just walk around. Right. Okay? But we're going to show how that happens according to a divine purpose, I hope. Oh, boy, I hope we got enough time. And, and, and it's never enough time, because two hours is just ain't enough right. to explain all, what's happening on all these charts. Mm -hmm. That's why we tell you to come back. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, that what I'm doing in these last several lessons, I, hopefully I'm systematically laying down certain things, you know, so that you can, you know, go by. All right, where we at? Uh, oh, we got Romans. Okay, let's. Okay, we got that out the way. Let's let's get Genesis twelve and one. Let's start there. And uh, I'm looking at the clock. It just tells me. Okay, I gotta fly. <laughs> okay. Genesis twelve and one. Now Yahweh had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed, as Yahweh had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed out of Haran. All right. Now, as we told you in the other lesson, this is the beginning of the third dispensation here, when Yahweh gave Abraham a promise. That's going to be confirmed shortly by Melchizedek, who was the king and high priest of Salem. 
Okay? So now Abraham was given a promise that through his seed, singular, mm -hmm. all the families of the earth would be blessed. All right? And this is a man who was 75 years old, and he was living in Haran. Haran is on the other side of the Euphrates River. So when he left Haran and crossed the Euphrates River and came down into Canaan's land, that made Abraham right. the first Hebrew, okay, or one from across the river. All right? Now, 15, Genesis 15 and 12, I think. Let's see. And when the sun was going down, uh -huh. a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, uh -huh. and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, No, but surely that thy seed should be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they will, shall afflict them for hundred years. And also, that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward, so they come out, of, out with a great substance. Okay, good enough, thank you. Now, Abraham was given the promise that his seed, that through his seed all the families of the earth would be blessed. But now we just read that that seed had to go down to a place they knew not. See, here's Abraham up here in Canaan's land. But now his seed had to go down into a land they knew not, and be evilly entreated. But they would come out with great substance. But they would be subject 400 years unto them. Now, a lot of people, when they read that scripture, think that, oh, as soon as the, the Israelites got to Egypt, they will be there for 400 years. I will have you know this. That 400 years started as soon as Yahweh told Abraham that. That 400 years started right then and there, even though that seed was still in Abraham's loins. Wow. You understand? Right. See, and now see, here's a principle that we want, we want you to, and we'll probably dwell on it in, some, in more subsequent lessons about um, time, okay? Time, that is to say this, you have prophetic time. Prophetic time is a day for a year. Correct. Or a year for a day. You have time with Yahweh Elohim, or creative time, which is a thousand years is one day, and one day is a thousand years. And then you have the day of Yahweh which is simply eternity, okay? Time begins and ends within the realm of eternity, okay? And so what we want to look at is principles, okay? Said so 400 years, let's get, uh, well, maybe to, to pull this point out, um, Psalms 90 and 4, since you're in the Old Testament, that's probably closer to you. Psalms 40 and 4? 90 and 4. 90 and 4. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Okay. It is as yesterday when it is past, and it is as a watch in the night. A thousand years. Okay? Now, let's take the last one. It says, as a watch in the night. When Yahshua Messiah came along, his mission was to fulfill the scriptures, all right? At that time, the Romans were running the country. Right. All right? And they had, and they were the Roman system. The Romans had four watches, according to the system, see? Now, the four watches, he said a thousand years is as a watch in the night, right? Right. So, four watches... See, four watches... Four times 1,000 would be like 4,000 years. Okay? All right? Now, zeros are placeholders. The principle we want is four. All right? That's the principle. Why? Let's go to the tabernacle. What is the fourth step? In the tabernacle. The door. It is the door. First Number door. four here. See, that's the door. Mm -hmm. All right? Yahshua himself said, I am the door. Okay? And he's coming in the 4,000 years. What do I want? I, I want Romans, I think. <sighs> Romans 5 and 12, maybe? Somewhere. I'm, that's what I'm thinking. Where, wherefore? 
as by one man sin that's, entering into the world. That's it. And death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. For into the law sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. There nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned. After the similitude of Adam's translation, who is the figure of, of him that was to come. All right. Now, that was 4,000 years. See? 4,000 years of darkness. Or four watches in the night. Yahshua's coming in in the 4,000th year. Joshua has got to come in the 400th year from the promise, from, from what Abraham was told in the 15th chapter, where he said, okay, your seed has to go down, all right? But they will be delivered. Joshua has got to come in the 400th year of that proclamation, okay? Joshua's fulfilling that by coming in the 4,000th year. The principle is the four, okay? Now, um, let's see, maybe Luke 3 and 20, uh, I want, because uh, I, 3 and 20, and he, and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit descended in the bodily shape like a dove. Upon him, no, I think it's above that. Uh, let me see. Now, when all, all the people were hold on, hold on. Uh, 323, that's what, go, go to the 23rd verse in that chapter and where you're at. Joshua himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed, the son of Joseph. Okay. He, the son of all right, that's good enough. See, 30 years, see, that's when Joshua began his ministry. Uh -huh. He's 30 years of age. Okay, now Joshua the son of Nun. Now look, uh -huh. let's, 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 let's try to understand something here. Uh, Genesis 2, no, 3. Genesis 3, uh, somewhere around 17, I'm thinking. I just want to excerpt, just to, just to illustrate a point. And unto Adam? Uh, go above that. Fifteen. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, uh -huh. and between thy seed and her seed. And he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy pain and thy conception. In pain thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. And he shall rule over thee. Okay, now, when that was told to Eve, Satan was there, and he heard that. All right? right? He heard that. So as far as Satan is concerned, in his mind, he said, oh, all I got to do is just do some birth control. <laughs> kill the baby. Yes. You know, or prevent it to be born, or if it is born, kill it. That's what happened down here in Egypt, if you remember Pharaoh had a death decree out to kill all the boy babies. Why? Because the spirit that was in Pharaoh right. Pharaoh said, wait a minute, he's coming, I know it. But so I'll, I'll kill all the boy babies. <laughs> Alright? Because he felt that. But Yahweh threw a curve. What do you mean? He just simply materialized down here. Full grown. Full grown man. I'm talking about Yahweh. Yahweh just appeared as a full grown man down here mm -hmm. in Egypt. Joshua, or rather Hoshea, the son of Nun. And he appeared to be 30 years of age. Mm -hmm. And he appeared that way for 30 years. Okay? See, he appeared that way. See, see, and you say, well, how do you know he was 30 years of age? Well, see, Joshua was 110 years old when he died. He spent 40 years in Canaan land. Right. And see, 40 years in the wilderness. That's 80. 80 minus 110 means that he was 30 years old when he came up out of Egypt. But we're telling you that he was 30 years old for 30 years. Right. Oh. That he appeared that way. But see, but the Israelites, see, they, they couldn't tell the difference. They saw him. 
interacted with him. Oh, who's he? Oh, that's, that's you know, oh, shit. Oh, who's he? Yeah, yeah, you know. That's old man Nun's son. Mm -hmm. And he's listed as such in the chronologies. Okay? Because he was attached. If you remember last week, we got into that about Jacob crossing his hands over the blessing. See, he was attached to the tribe of Ephraim. Right. But he appeared down here in Egypt. See, at, and he left Egypt. He was 30 years old. Right. Okay? Now, let's get... Uh, Hmm. Numbers, is it 14? You know, prophetic time is what I want. Um, yeah, where, where, where are you at? 14 and 34. Yeah, 14, 34. After the number of the days in which ye surveyed the land, even 40 days, each day for a year mm -hmm. shall be shall ye bear your iniquities. Even forty years ye shall know the withdrawal of my promise. Mm -hmm. Forty years. Okay. Now we read this last week, and it's in the previous chapter in Numbers where, where Moses commissioned mm -hmm. twelve spies from one from each tribe to go and spy out this land, right. Canaan's land, and it took them forty days to do this. That's why Yahweh punished them a day for a year. And they ended up being 40 years out here in the wilderness. All right? It's 40 years. Now, here's Yahshua fulfilling this, Matthew 4 and 1. I'm, I'm doing this quickly because I want to get to some other things. You know, you know, you know I've done this a lot of times. You know, you can, there's other lectures you can look. But I'm, I'm going through this kind of quickly because I want to get to some other stuff that I want to bring in that I think can help emphasize this thing about being the greatest mystery ever perpetrated. Okay. Matthew 4 and 1. Right. Then was Joshua led up of the Spirit into the wilderness mm -hmm. to be tested by the adversary. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. 40 days and 40 nights. He's out in the wilderness being tested by the adversary. For why? That's a fulfillment of the 40, year, 40 years that the Israelites were out there in the wilderness of Sinai. Okay? Now, um, we told you that Joshua spent 40 years in the conquest of Canaan's land. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, Joshua, and listen, that that came about, maybe let, let, me, let me put something up in here. Get uh, Deuteronomy 34 and 6, and Joshua... I think it's three and one. Thirty four and five. Start there. So Moses, the servant of Yahweh, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of Yahweh. And he was and he buried him in the valley of of the, in the land of Moab, over against Beshur, but no man knoweth his sepulchre unto this unto this day. And Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died; his eyes were not dim, nor his natural force abate. And the children of Israel went from Moses in the plains in Moab thirty days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. Okay. Now when Moses, Moses died here. Um, no, I want Joshua 1 and 10. That's what I want. Now, Moses died here. He died on this side of the Jordan. And we got it right here at Mount Nebo. Okay? And they mourned for Moses 30 days. If you remember, we told you that the river Jordan is likened to the sixth step. Right. Veil. Of the pattern, the veils. Mm -hmm. Okay? Which is, or is also the veil of the flesh. All right? Now, they mourned for Moses 30 days. And, and this is what else happened. Read Joshua 1 and 10. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare your evictuals, mm -hmm. for within three days ye shall pass over 
this Jordan to go into possess the land. Okay, so now thirty-three days after the death of Moses, that's when they crossed over. Right. What do you mean? Why thirty-three days? Mm -hmm. Well, how long was Joshua in the flesh? Thirty-three. Thirty-three years. See, that's a folk. See, Joshua. That's a fulfillment of that. See. And see, now they crossed over. And see, j just as Joshua's death, burial, and resurrection, Joshua, Acts 1 and 2, see, Joshua tarried on earth for 40 days. Mm -hmm. See? See, that, that 40 days that he tarried is a fulfillment of Joshua's and another's 40-year conquest in Canaan land. Acts. Acts 1 and 2. Until the day in which he was taken up, after he went through the, after that he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after, after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of them the things pertaining to the kingdom of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Okay, forty days. See, that's... That's Joshua, fulfilling Joshua, the son of Nun, 40 years for the conquest of Canaan's land. You add them up together, that's 110. Add this up together, it's 110. See, now that picks Joseph up. Because Joseph was 110 years old right. when he died. And what did Joseph say? He said, look, Elohim shall surely visit you. Visit you. Right. See, and when he do, take my bones up out of here. Yeah. How would they know? How would what would be the sign that would show them that Elohim had visited them? Mm -hmm. Well, Joshua lived 110 years. Joshua was attached to the tribe of Ephraim, who was a son of Joseph. See, right. these were little things that jo you know, and jo and Joseph said himself. He said, "Look, fear not. I'm in the place of Elohim. Right. But Elohim will surely visit you. See, okay." And it was Joshua's son of Nun, see, who, who brought them up out of here. All right. Um, uh, just to put an emphasis, let's see. Exodus. 14th chapter. I think it's 14. Yeah. I think it's 14 and 13. See, this is where they, they've come up out of here after the institution of the Passover. And the blood sign on the door and the death of the firstborn of man and beast. And not to mention nine other plagues, ten mm -hmm. devastating plagues altogether. Now they're coming up out. They're following a phenomenal cloud, right. see, that led them. All right? And now they come to the Red Sea, and this is what Moses says. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of Yahweh, mm -hmm. which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye should see them again no more forever. And Yahweh shall fight for you, and ye should hold your peace. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Wherefore cried thou to me? Now see, now, now Moses said, Why are you crying to me? When did Moses cry out, crying to this guy standing next to him? When he said, Salvation of Yahweh. See, that's just the English translation. In Hebrew, he says, stand still and see Yahshua. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. Stand still and see Yahshua. And Yahshua's standing right next to him. And so he says, why are you crying to me? See, in other words, he's telling them, it's not time for these people to know who I am yet, but what? Read. Why the Christ to, uh, to me? And, and he says, that they go forward. Uh, I was saying to Moses, wherefore Christ thou to me? Speak unto the children of Okay, good enough. All right. So now Joshua's giving them a study. He said, lift the rod up. Mm -hmm. See? Lift the rod so the sea can divide, so the people can go forth. See, but it wasn't time for them to know who he was yet. Right. See, however, they, they were warned. Exodus 23 and 20. They were warned. Exodus 23 and 20. Mm -hmm. Behold, I will send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. 
Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Okay, so now he says, there's an angel in this cloud that they follow. See, all right, and, and, and don't provoke him. Because he will not pardon your transgression. My name is in him. What name might that be? Yahshua. Name is Yahshua, whose name is Yahweh in salvation. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, we got to get this other thing in here. I want you to get Leviticus. I think it's 25 and 5. Uh, 25 and 8. That's what I want. Because somebody could say, well, we got, um, got Joshua and Yahshua here, 110. They're picking up Joseph. All right? Now, we want to show you how they pick it up, like, you know, Moses and some other things. Um, read Leviticus 25 and 8. And thou shalt be numbered seven Sabbaths of a year unto thee, seven times seven, and the space of the seventh Sabbaths of the years shall be unto thee forty and, forty and, forty and nine years. And thou shalt cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, in the day of the atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all the land, and ye shall follow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof, even it shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possessions, and ye shall return every man unto his family. Okay, good enough. All right. So in the 50th year, there had to be a jubilee, mm -hmm. all right? Now, this law, which is part of the 613 ordinances that Yahweh gave them, was given to the Israelites when they were in the wilderness of Sinai, mm -hmm. all right? And there's the reason why I say that. They could not implement this law until they got to Canaan's land, Okay. And see, and so once they got to Canaan's land, then, see, once they got, because see, for them to implement that law, they had to have their own land. Right. They couldn't do it out here in the wilderness because it was not their own land. Right. Once the land had been secured up here through Joshua's 40 years of conquest, right. 10 years after his death, they celebrated the first jubilee, right. which would be 50, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so 10 Ten years after Joshua's death would be 120. Ten days later, Acts 2 and 1, because we read that Joshua tarried for 40 days, and then he ascended. We didn't read it, but we'll tell you. See, here he is. Yeah, his death, burial, resurrection. He tarried for 40 days. At the end of 40 days, he ascended. All right, into the into heaven, so to speak, into the cloud. He ascended. All right. Then ten days later, he poured out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Acts two and one. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, while they were all with one accord in one place, suddenly there was a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like fire, like as fire, and rest upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues. Okay, good enough. Good enough. I just wanted to just establish, this is, this was, this happened 10 days after Yahshua ascended, at the end of the 40 days. Mm -hmm. Just like Jubilee happened 10 years after the death of Joshua, son of Nun. Add that together, that's 120. Add the 10 days over here. That's 120. Now this picks up. Yashua, here's Yashua because he's fulfilling all of this. Here's, here's 120. That picks up Moses. Because we read Moses was 120 years old when he died. That picks him up. Mm -hmm. That picks up Noah. How long did Noah preach? Mm -hmm. 120 years. Okay. The first three kings of the united monarchy of Israel. And Judah. See, the united monarchy was, the first three kings were Saul, David, and Solomon. Mm -hmm. They each ruled 40 years apiece. Mm -hmm. Four times, 40 times three is 120. That picks that up. See, Yahshua's picking this, he's fulfilling Jot and Tittle. Right. That's the point I'm making. 
But in this little exercise, we're showing you how Joshua is the same as Joshua. Joshua is instituting, and here he is over here, fulfilling. Okay? Now, how are we doing here? I've got a good hour. Okay, now, I want to try to bring something else in. And it might be a little more comprehensive, I think, but I'm going to try to make it as simple as I can. Okay? All right, I hope you got this written down, all right? Now, and it goes back to the Moses chart. Right here, I don't know if you can zoom in on that, you know, that you can see that, this pyramid right here, all right, and it says 2520 on there, all right, 2520. Now, there's a reason why it's there, and the pyramid, the Great Pyramid as well, okay, all right, the Great Pyramid is along, along with the Sphinx, right, see, we don't have it up there, but I'll throw the Sphinx in there too, because they don't know who built it. Right. Now, they try to say the Great Pyramid was built by Cheops, you know, some king back there, some, you know, you know, and they try to sweeten it up and say, well, here's a black king, you know, and all that, you know, and I'm like, nah. Because <laughs> our founder said this. He said that no man, no man built the pyramid. In fact, he kind of said it matter of fact, he said why, uh, a quote is, why an angel could pick up one of those massive stones with his pinky. Mm -hmm. That's what the founder said. See, I talked to Peter Godot one time, and I asked him where did these objects come from. He said, "This, if I remember, he, if he told me correctly, he said that after the the flood, right. the great flood, they, when the waters receded, they just appeared. They were just there, because the word speaks itself." Means what is it? Because when the people came to Egypt and they saw it, that's what they said. Speaks. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> At that time, it was the head of a man, paws of a lion, feet of, back feet of the calf, and wings of an eagle. And but but see, but over the centuries it had it had eroded. Mm -hmm. But here's the mystery about the Sphinx, and the scientists checked it out. The erosion on the Sphinx is caused by water. And yet, here it is sitting in the middle of the desert. Wow. How do you explain that? See? How do you explain, you know, I mean, they tried to explain how this pyramid came about. Mm -hmm. You know, now, you know, and then, you know, the biggest joke about the pyramid is, you know, people ask, well, how did those people move those massive bricks, those you know, massive stones? And, you know, and, and, you know, and the answer is, well, they use massive whips. <laughs> 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 but really, the pyramid, the Great Pyramid, no man built. And it has the number 2520 on here. As a matter of fact, Dr. Kelly has said that, and he told folks that this was 1971, he went on the first peace mission. And, uh, well, this was told to me by Dennis Jular, but you can see this thing also in, uh, I think it's in the video of the history of IDMR with uh, Dr. Mary Gross. She made a comment about it, too. Because um, Dennis Jular told me, because I asked him about it, and he said, well, when they went to Egypt, to Egypt right. and they were at the foot of the pyramid, and Dennis Jular said, he asked Dr. Kinley, he said, he said, Doc, he said, where's the number 2520 at? And he said, Dr. Kinley just looked up and he just pointed, he says, right, it's right there. But it's in a chamber that they can't get to. And that's what Dennis Jular told me personally. A couple of years ago, these scientists, these natural scientists did some imaging stuff, this imaging, you know, on the pyramid, you know, it was just a, you know, map it out and all, and they found a giant volume of, volume of space in the pyramid above the king's chamber that, um, that has no entrance or exit to. It's just this big space that's there. But they can't get in and they can't get out. But they just discovered it for the first time. Nobody else knew about this space, see, except one person. And that was Henry Clifford Kinley. Because he knew about it when he was there in 1971. He said, yeah, this is in a space they can't get to. Now, how did he, what, did he have x-ray vision or something? <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. how did he know that? That blows my, I mean, that still blows my mind. The first time I heard it, because I saw it on a, what was one of these PBS programs, uh, what right. was it, Nova or something, and they were talking about it, and they said that, and, I was, and it, just, it just blew me away, because I remember what Dennis Gerard had told me that Kelly, Dr. Kelly had told him. And I was like, <laughs> I said, now he just can't. 
I mean, at least how can you, you know, how, how, how can you just not? I mean, he just said, yeah, it's in a space they can't get to. <laughs> how do you know that? Nobody else in the nobody else in the universe knew that. Right. But him, until these scientists came along, and I was like, wow, <laughs> this just blows my mind. But anyway, twenty five twenty. What is twenty five twenty? Okay, twenty five twenty. Let's break it down. Part of it is a date. And uh, we haven't gotten into it yet. I know we talked about the Asian dispensations charts, but we didn't really get into like dates and stuff. You know, perhaps another lesson we will. Mm -hmm. Generally, I like to do it in the fall because that's when the numbers work out perfect. But, <laughs> but for this session, put it to you like this. When the Israelites left Egypt, they left Egypt in the year 1491 BBY. In other words, 1,491 years before the birth of Yahshua. Okay? And that's a date. All right? I could say this. I can say that the Israelites left Egypt in the year 2513 AM. Ano Mundi. Ano Mundi. The year of the world. That simply means the numbers are going straight. So 2513 years after Adam was kicked out of the garden. Israel left Egypt, okay? Both of these dates are valid. One is coming down, the other is before. If I were to add these dates together, <sighs> it would come out to 4,004. Now, <clears throat> we know there's a four-year error in the calendar. Right. How do we know that? Well, that was pointed out by uh, Archbishop Usher. When he made his calculations. And see, the calculations we use is the same calculations a lot of other folks use. It's the Bible itself. Okay? So now, because there's a four-year error, how do you reconcile that? Well, what the theologians did was push the birth date of the Messiah back by four years. See, they would say this. They would say that the Messiah was born in the year four BC and he died in the year 29 AD. AD stands for Anno Domini, the year of the master, and not after his death. <laughs> I used to know people who thought that. No, this is Anno Domini, the year of the master. Okay. Now, because they pushed it back four years because of the four year era. Well, that's fine because even in the four year era, Yahweh's going to be right, because when you subtract that date from 4,004, 4, you will find that it is 4,000 years from Adam to Yahshua, mm -hmm. which is the same as four days, or four watches in the night. Mm. Okay? Now, back to 2520. I, I had to explain this so that I can move on to the next thing. The next thing is simply this, because we read prophetic time is a day is for a, a year, one year is the same as one day, one day is the same as a year. If the children of Israel left Egypt 25, 13 a.m. and they come here to Mount Sinai, Moses goes up, oh, let's read it. Exodus 24, 9, and 10. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab, and Abiah, and seventy elders of Israel. And they saw the Elohim of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, a body of heaven in its clearness. 
and upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also they did, they saw Elohim and did eat and drink. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, and thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua. Uh, he rose up and his minister Joshua. Put your finger there and read the first verse in that chapter. And he said unto Moses, now let her read. And he said unto so, Moses, Come up unto Yahweh, thou, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near Yahweh. Uh -oh. But they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with them. Okay, Moses is told to come up alone and by himself. Now go back to where you were. And, and Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua. And Moses went up into the mount of Elohim. See, now he, and his minister Joshua, he was told to go by, alone and by himself. He's still going alone and by himself. Why? Because the person who told him to come up alone and by himself is going with him. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right, keep going. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. And Moses went up into the, in the mount, and the cloud covered it, the mount. Mm -hmm. And the glory of Yahweh abode Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days, and and the colon, and the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. All right, and the cloud covered seven days, six days Moses was up in there, and she, and she put the obligatory word in there, colon. Mm -hmm. See, which means that it, which means that demands an explanation. Mm -hmm. See, and that's why because he he's sh being shown these days of creation. See, according to the first chapter of Genesis, it didn't take Yahweh six days to make the universe. No. It just took Yahweh six days to show it to Moses because it took Moses a whole solar day to see various aspects of what Yahweh was doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, but here's the point I'm making. See, it was he's up in there seven days. Up in this cloud. We just told you that they left out Israelites in the year 2513 AM. Moses goes up here. Joshua, Joshua's transfigured is really Joshua is transfiguring before Moses and showing Moses this, this super incorporeal Eloistic form. Mm -hmm. And he's up and saying, and it's and he's showing them changing to a tabernacle and then back into himself and to each day of the creation or each aspect of the universe. Alright? Now, we told you that each day, prophetically speaking, is a day for a year. So there's seven days. Six days, he, six creative day, one sabbatical day. Mm -hmm. Seven days all together. So if you was to look at it, seven, you know, prophetically speaking, seven years, you could add that on there. And that would be 2520. Right. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, look, on the seventh day, what's happening here? Elohim is standing, that's what 2520 is pointing to, is Elohim. Mm -hmm. See, the reason why it's on the pyramid, because the pyramid represents the chief cornerstone of the universe, which is what Elohim is, because he's the first cause of all creation. So he's the first cornerstone. Okay? And he is 2520. Okay? Now, we have it here. We just, we had it read here. About Moses going up this mount. Him and Joshua, all right? Let's see, the, let's look at the fulfillment. Let's get uh, Matthew. Uh, I think it's Matthew 16, 17 and 1. See, see, if he's instituting... Then we got to see where he's fulfilling. Okay? And after six days, Joshua taketh up Peter, James, and John, and his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. Now, now, why is he doing that? See, he said Peter, James, and John. Well, let's draw a line over here. Draw a line over here. Mm -hmm. Here's Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. Aaron is the elder. Nadab and Abihu, his two sons, mm -hmm. are two brothers. Right. Draw a line back here. Here's Peter. He's the elder of the disciples. 
James and John, they are brothers. Mm -hmm. Okay? They're up a mountain. Moses and Joshua are up a mountain. You understand? I'm just showing you one is instituting, right. the other is fulfilling. Right. Keep reading. And was and was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun and his raiment. Yeah, he's transfigured before them, just like come over here. Mm -hmm. Just like Joshua, because Joshua, what we read, Joshua went up with Moses. Mm -hmm. Joshua, how do you think this elementary form came about up here for Moses to see? It mm -hmm. was Joshua, the son of Nun, transfiguring in front of Moses. Correct. It's the same thing. Read. And his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them. Moses, Elijah talking with him. Moses and Elijah talking with them. See, why Moses and Elijah? Mm -hmm. Moses represents the law. First five books of the Bible. Elijah represents the prophet, mm -hmm. the mouthpiece. See, now that doesn't make Elijah less valid. You know, it's the Holy Spirit that's doing the work. So what you got here is Joshua flanked by his witnesses, the law and the prophet, or the law and the testimony. Right. He can't do nothing without witnesses. Right. Okay? Continue. Then Peter said unto Joshua, Sire, it is good for us to be here. Mm -hmm. If thou willest, willest, let us make here three tabernacles. Mm -hmm. One for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Why is he talking about a tabernacle? Come back here. What Wasn't a tabernacle talked about back mm -hmm. here? Because we didn't read it, but Moses was up here 40 days. The first seven days, we accounted for it. The other 33 days, he's looking at this tabernacle, you know, the inner workings of this, culminating in 40 days. See, just as Moses, when we said about the law, Moses represents the law in the Testament, didn't Moses, after this, came down with the table of stones, the law, mm -hmm. and Joshua was with him, the prophet, the testimony. Mm -hmm. everything, everything is correlatable. Right. Dr. Kinley said it best. You must make these correlations. Right. Else, you must remain a skeptic. That's why I tell people, use the charts. Right. Too often I see people just standing in front of the chart. They're just talking. You know, from minutes on in, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50, and they're just talking. Talk. They're not they're like the charts is their backdrop. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. It's not your backdrop. Right. These are a set of tools for you to use. If you don't use them, then you just, all you doing is standing up here soliloquizing. You know, come up with this soliloquy. You just, you know, you're edifying yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. You're not edifying the assembly. You're just edifying yourself. Use the tools that the founder gave us. See? Because these are the things that you're going to, look, how else are you going to prove whatever it is you're talking about? Right. This is a divine vision that you're seeing up here laid out here. And, we, and if we make the claim that nobody can successful, successfully refute this vision, see, the only way that can happen is if you present this vision properly mm -hmm. or fluently, as the scripture says. Okay? Where were we at? Okay. Uh, and Peter, and then answered Peter and said, Sorry, it's good for us to be here. If thou willest, let us make us three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Mm -hmm. While he had spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Why is it why, why a bright cloud? Draw a line. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there a cloud back here? Right. That overshadowed all these folks? Mm -hmm. See, I know it, it looks the way we got it painted looks tame, but I will have you know this was a fierce object. Mm -hmm. Okay, thunders and lightnings and darkness and mm -hmm. earthquakes and all. Yeah, this was fierce. Mm -hmm. But Yahshua's got to fulfill it. It was a cloud here. I mean, it's a cloud here. He's fulfilling it by having a cloud appear here. Read. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Well, the, Hear you him. This cloud, this cloud had a voice. That, we got lips up here. <laughs> yeah. this, this, there, was a, there was a voice that came out of this cloud mm -hmm. too. The Israelites heard it. They didn't like it. Right. <laughs> okay? Keep reading. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. Mm -hmm. And Yahshua came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And then they had lifted up their eyes 
and they saw no man save Yahshua only. Read. And as they came down from the mount, Yahshua charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man, mm -hmm. and to the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Oh, so to the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. What do you mean? That means that he had to live before, right. die before, resurrected before. See, and see, they came down the mountain. See, look, they had to go up the mountain, and then they had to come back down the mountain. In other words, they did a round trip. Mm. Okay, and it was on the seventh day they went up there. It was on the Sabbath day they went up there, the seventh day. What do you mean? Look, if they went, did a round trip, that's, that's 300. That's 360 degrees, right? And they did it on the seventh day, 360, yeah, 360 times seven equals 2520. See, that's how Yahshua fulfilled it. He fulfilled 2520 here because it was 2520 back here. You see? Okay, that's 25, 20. And see, and it's showing you, see, that really what you're dealing with is, 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 is all that which Yahweh could put into a body to say that this, the head, if you will, see, walking around, because that's who Joshua the son of Nun was. He was that head. Mm -hmm. Joshua the Messiah, he was that head. Uh, how much time I got? I think I could get this in here. Um... Because see, there, see, look, there were 70 chosen here. Why? Because there were 70 elders back here. Right. There were 70 chosen not long after this event. Oh, where is that at? Is that... Um, Matthew? Mm, Luke, Luke, I think it's Luke, the 10th chapter. Mm -hmm. That's what I want. into every city place whether he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but I but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore to Elohim who directs the harvest and that would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as a lamb among wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into and into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn you again. Okay, good enough on that. I mean, you could go back and read some more. But I just wanted to bring this little particular point out. Jump down to the 17, because Joshua sent them out. Two by two. And he gave them power mm -hmm. to do things. He gave them power to the, the heal the sick, you know, uh, make the blind to see, the deaf to hear, cast out demons, okay? And so now they went out. They were gone for a little while. Now they're coming back, and this is what, what's up. And the 70 return again with joy, saying, Rabbi, even the demons are subjected unto, unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold... I give unto you power to tread on the serpents and the scorpions, and over all the power of the enemies, and nothing shall be any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the demons are subjected unto you, but rather rejoice because your names were written in heaven. Okay, now that's that's the pertinent point. See, people come to try to impress folks, oh, I can prophesy, or I can... Heal people, I could cast demons out. No, don't, don't, that ain't nothing as far as Joshua is concerned. Rejoice that your name is written in the book of life and that you have not been blotted out. Okay? Start bringing that up. Okay, now, I got much time I got. I think I can fit this in here. I hope if I could belabor this. Another application of 2520. Okay? Let's get. We're in Luke, aren't we? Uh, I think it's the 22nd chapter. I think. 
Uh, okay. Uh, 21. Actually, 21. 21. Uh, start with 20. And when they shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of them depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, and all things which were written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trotted down of the Gentiles until the times the Gentiles be fulfilled. Okay, good enough. This is Joshua speaking. And he's telling he's telling his disciples this is what's going to happen. And all these things are going to be happening, and they'll be trodden underfoot mm -hmm. until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And we all know what the word fulfill means. Right. Complete, brought to an end, that sort of promise, mm -hmm. etc. All right, till the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Question. When did the times of the Gentiles begin? See? See? When did they begin? Mm -hmm. All right? Now, we've shown you some dates in here and the times. All right? Let's get Exodus 34 and 1. Let's start there. Now, we told you that uh, the date was 1491 mm -hmm. BBY, before the birth of Joshua, that the Israelites came up out of Egypt, breed. And Yahweh said unto Moses, You are two tables of stone, like the first. And I will write upon these tables the words that were written in the first tables of stone, which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up into the morning until the mount, unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any see throughout all the mount. Neither let the flocks nor the herds feed before the mount. And you are two tables of stone, like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up into the mount as Yahweh had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood with them there, there and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. And Yahweh passed by before him and proclaimed Yahweh, <laughs> Yahweh El, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquities and transgressions and sin. And that will be by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children. And uh, unto the third and fourth generation. Okay. I know it was a bit long, but, but I wanted to put it in context. So when we got to that part, you would understand why. To the third and the fourth generation. Okay. Let's take the higher number. Four. The fourth generation. And we said that zeros are placeholders. Mm -hmm. Correct. They could be added or subtracted. 1491 BBY. This is when the Israelites left Egypt. 400 years from that would be... Let's see, 1490. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, four, 490, rather. 490 years. From, from this date, 400, and I, the reason why I have 490 is because 70 weeks of years, right? Right. it's a principle. Yeah. So 490 years from this date, Solomon's temple right. is dedicated, see, okay? In the year 1000, it's really a thousand and a half, but I can round it off to a thousand and one. And this is what Dr. Kinley does in the textbook. Why? Because there's a particular date that has to come up. And so for this particular date to come up, then you're going to have to do it the way he's laid it out. 
So now he's got this down here, 1001, which is when the temple was dedicated. Now we just read, now, let me, let me put this over here. Maybe if I did this, let's see. Temple, temple. Uh, dedicated. All right, this is when the temple was dedicated. That means this. In 1004, right. see, the temple was finished. All right? And, and see, and we got a thousand, that means it, because it was three years for the dedication. All right? Here's the reason why I'm separating this. All right? And we're going to take the 400 years that Yahweh judged Israel according to what he said to Moses. Now, if we take 400 years and subtract that from 1004 when the temple was finished, mm -hmm. that would take us to the year 6004 BBY. Why? This is the reason. 2 Kings 24 and 1. In his in his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, came up and Joachim became his servant three years, and he turned and rebelled against him. And Yahweh sent again him hand, bands of the Chaldeans, and bands of Syrian, and bands of the Moabites. I think you missed something. Okay. Try it again. Just in, just reread it. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, came up to Joachim. Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. Mm -hmm. He came a servant three years. Three years. That's that's the part I wanted to hear. Three years. He came, in other words, <laughs> I'll make it real plain. Nebuchadnezzar walked. They really took Israel without a fight. Right. They took Judah without a fight. This was Judah now, not Israel, because this is long after the, the tribe split. Mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar literally walked into Judah and just slapped Jehoiakim and said, "I'm running this place now." And, and, and said, look, you, you can still stay on the throne, but at the end of the year, mm -hmm. I want my cut. Right. All right? I want, I want tax. I want tribute. Mm -hmm. You know? That's really what it's about. And see, Jehoiakim was a servant for three years. Mm -hmm. All right? And then, and then uh, read. Then he became a servant three years. Then he turned and reveled a rebel, he rebelled. He rebelled again after three. In other words, after three years, he got tired of paying. I was like, "Damn, I can't even throw myself a party because I got to pay tribute to this guy." So after three years of going through that hardship, he said, "Man, I, he just said I ain't paying no more. You can tell your boy, you can tell your boss, I ain't, you ain't getting nothing from me." <laughs> and Nebuchadnezzar, you know, man, this is what do you think gangsters get this stuff from? <laughs> you know, what do you think? You know, I mean, people, you know, talking about, oh, we got to regulate that. What, what do you think? Where do you think you got it from? Let me kill Ezra and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, these Jews, wait a minute, these Jews ain't paying my money? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, fellas, we got to go down here to Judah, see about my money. Regulate them. You know, we need to, re yeah, we need to go regulate. <laughs> <laughs> and they had to do that three times. You can read about it in this chapter. We won't go through it all. But see, but this is when Nebuchadnezzar, see, Nebuchadnezzar first came in 604 right. BBY. And then Judah became a servant three years, and in the year 601 wow. BBY, read. Sure, okay. And Yahweh sent against him three, three, uh, him, three bands of the Chaldeans and bands of Syrians and bands of Mobilites and bands of children of Ammon and sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of Yahweh, which he spoke by his servants and prophets. Surely okay, good enough. Now, when did that happen? That happened in 601 BBY. That's when Nebuchadnezzar took direct control of Judah. Mm -hmm. And that begins the times of the Gentiles. See, because he made, Nebuchadnezzar made three incursions right, right. into Judah. You know, where he did, uh, I mean, he did a lot of damage. Took prisoners. The third time he, he, he came, he, he destroyed, the third time, he destroyed Solomon's temple and the wall surrounding Jerusalem. Mm -hmm.
See, and they were, and, and he took the people, the cream of the crop. Right. Daniel being one of them, you can read about that right. in Daniel. See, the times, as a matter of fact, let's read that. Daniel 1 and 1. See, because that, that was the beginning of the times of the Gentiles in 601 that Yahshua spoke about. Right. See, this started here. Okay? You can read Job, you got it. What, what, what chapter? It's Daniel, Jan, Daniel first chapter, one and one. In, in the third year, uh, the reign of Jehoiakim, mm -hmm. king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and to Jerusalem, and he said, Yahweh gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessel of the house of Elohim, which he carried into the land of Shishna. To the house of his deity. And he brought the vessel into the treasure house of this deity. And the king spoke unto Aspinas, the master of his eunuchs, that he put it to bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of, of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but was favored and skillful in all wisdom and skillful in knowledge and understanding science. And such as had ability them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the, and learn the learning on the tongue of the Chaldeans. Okay, good enough. All right, see, that's Daniel. He, he was one of those that were taken mm -hmm. to Babylon 601, the times of the Gentiles, the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. What does that mean? Israel. See, we read about Abraham, how he was given the promise that through his seed, all families of the earth would be blessed. Right. We didn't read it, but we'll tell you this. He was given the, you know, all of Canaan's land. He walked the length and breadth of Canaan's land, but he never set foot on the promised land. Right. Okay. But it was always about an inheritance. When the Israelites got their inheritance, okay, they still disobeyed Yahweh. Yahweh took that inheritance from them. Right. First, he sent them judges. Right. All right. He sent them judges to judge them. There were 13 judges, uh, rather 15 judges, prior to uh, their first king, Samuel being the last. That's right. Okay. But they still were messing up. I'm talking about the Israelites. They were still messing up. And so, so finally, Yahweh simply dispossessed them of their land. He told them they would do it. Right. Um, maybe we should read that. I've got time. Let's go to Deuteronomy. We could we could read that where Yahweh said he would do it. Yeah. Um, I think it's Deuteronomy. Uh, I know it's way back. At, uh, Hello. Uh, yes, I went up the door. Uh, Twenty Deuteronomy twenty-eight and uh, forty-nine. And, 49. Mm -hmm. and Yahweh shall bring a nation against thee from the ends of the earth, mm -hmm. as swift as the eagle flies a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, mm -hmm. a nation of fierce continents, which shall not regard the person of old, nor show favor to the young. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, and also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, incense of thy kind, and flocks of thy sheep, until he had destroyed thee. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates, and to the high and fenced wall. Come down where thou trustest throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee in all the gates throughout all the land which Yahweh Elohim had given thee. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thy own body, and flesh thou sons and the daughters which Yahweh Elohim had given thee in the siege and in the straightness where with enemies shall distress thee, so that the man that is tender among you and the very de delicate his eyes shall be evil towards his brother and towards his wife and towards his bosom and towards the remnant of the children which he shall leave so that he will not give to any of them a flesh of his children, 
whom he has eat shall eat, because he had nothing left him in the siege, and in the straightness wherewith thy enemies shall distress thee in all thy gates. Okay, now, that sounds like Nebuchadnezzar, mm -hmm. because that's what happened. His siege was so terrible, it was so terrifying that people, they starved. They were eating each other for right. food. Mm, cannibals. You know? That's how bad it was. Mm -hmm. Jump down and see now, but, but that was the invasion. See, it's in the law. Right. Yahweh said he, that it would happen. It didn't say it might happen. Yeah, it's going on. See, it said, what? It said a, a, a nation of fierce continents and a different time. That sounds like Nebuchadnezzar to me. All right, jump down to verse um, 63. And it shall come to pass that as Yahweh rejoice over you, and to you good, and to multiply you, so Yahweh will rejoice over you, to destroy you, and to bring you to naught, that ye shall be plucked from off the land, whether thou goest to possess it. And Yahweh shall scatter thee among all the people, from one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there shall you serve other Elohim, neither thou shalt have thy father, have known even wood and stone. And among these nations shall thou go, shall thou find no ease, neither shall the soul of thy feet have rest. But Yahweh shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing eyes and sorrow of mind, and thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And thou shalt fear day and night, and thou shalt have none assist utterance of thy life, assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would that, would that it were evening. Oh, no, I don't, I, you, you, you read not the only name. I like the King James Version. Here, read the, read the King James Version. Yeah, yeah, right there. See? In the morning thou shalt say, Would God. Or would Elohim be on your Yeah, would him, it were evening. In other words, it's like it's so bad, you're going to say, Oh, oh, Elohim, if it would just only be evening, read. Huh. At evening. Thou will say, with Elohim, it were even it would be morning. Oh, and then, but in, in the evening, at night you're going to say, oh, Elohim, if it was only day. <laughs> See, you can't win for losing. If it was day, you're going to say, oh, if it was only night. And when night comes, oh, if it was only day. <laughs> <laughs> for, the fear, for the fear of thy heart, wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thy eyes, which thou shalt see. And Yahweh, and Yahweh. That's good enough. That's good enough. I just wanted to read. It, they would be dispossessed of their land. They got scattered. Mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar scattered them. But it was according to prophecy. Right. Why? It's in the law. Let's go to the prophecy. Jeremiah 25 and 11, I think. Mm -hmm. See, because for Jeremiah to say what he had to say, he's got to draw out from what Moses had to say. Oh, right. All right? Disobedience. 25 and 11? Uh, yeah. Moreover, I would take from them... 25 and 11. Yeah, 25 and 11. And this whole land should be desolation and astonishment. And this nation should serve the king of our land seven years. And it should come to pass when 70 years are completed, accomplished, that I will punish the king of our land, that the nation say Yahweh, him for their iniquity and the land of Chaldeans will make it a perpetual desolation. Okay, good enough. All right, see, for Jeremiah to say what he said, he had to draw it off the law. We, 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 we had read where Jeremiah said, he, he, Jeremiah is just drawing out from what Moses said. Mm -hmm. He's confirming what Moses said. And we showed you here that it happened here. 604 BBY. See, when Nebuchadnezzar came, three years, Jehoiakim was his servant, and then Nebuchadnezzar came in with his, with his heavy artillery and said, nah, we, we, we just take it over. We just, well, actually they did. They took over and they killed Jehoiakim and, and they put another king up. And he, and he messed up and they came and they killed him. See, like people don't, you know, Nebuchadnezzar was like, you know, damn, man, don't these Jews learn, know how, learn their lessons? He had to come back three times and deal with these folks. See? But in 601, that's the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. Right. Now you say, now what does that have to do with 2520? Okay, let's, uh, let's go to our textbook, volume 4. This is, this is what Dr. Kinley wrote. Uh, 
page 43. Volume 4, page 43. Table according to prophetic time? No, that's at the top. Yeah. Start at the top? Uh, yeah. Jeroboam yeah. was made king of the ten northern tribes and set up for the time of his of his capital at Chechem. It was the first capital of the new kingdom. So subsequently, Tar Tarzer became to, go ahead. became the royal residence, if not if not the capital of Jeroboam, and of his successor. The division of the kingdom known as Israel rapidly declined into the years 721 B.Y. King Hoshea, the son of and the ten tribes, were carried captive to Assyria. Syria. 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 And Shamanizers. Shamanizers, okay. Shamanizers. Or by Sargon. 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 His successor. His successor. The two tribes uh -huh. known as Judah survived over a hundred years longer, mm -hmm. and in the 606 B.Y., the second Babylonian Empire was set up under the rulership of Nabopolassi, Nabopolassi, father of Nebuchadnezzar. Note particularly that the first Babylonian Empire was in 2247 B.Y. Mm -hmm. under Nimrod, which was already been adequately discussed in his, this book. Nebuchadnezzar led an army against Judah and overcame Nineveh and Egypt while his father reigned. We have shown that Solomon's temple was finished in 1004 and a half and dedicated in 1000 and a half B.Y. Okay, see now that we got it up here, that's why I, I got it rounded off like this, took the halves of 1004 when it was finished and 1001 when it was dedicated. Right. All right, that's three years. All right, go ahead. Then 400 years after the temple was finished would, sorry, would be 604 B.Y. 604 B.B.Y., read. Then Nebuchadnezzar, successor of Nebuchadnezzar. 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 Ascended the Babylon throne, Babylonian throne, according to Smith's um, Palibet. Palibet Dictionary. <laughs> of the Bible, page 437, and overthrew Judah and subjected them three years servitude for their own, for their own land of Canaan. See, the three years servitude. See, in 604, then three years servitude in their own land. See, mm -hmm. read. Judah was later taken captive to Babylon. Babylon. These actions on the part of Nebuchadnezzar were in obedience to the will of Yahweh stupefied in the judgment and laws which Yahweh had made between himself and children of Israel in the Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. Then Babylonians' captivity in 601 B.Y. is confirmed by Yahweh al in that he told Solomon that he would let the temple stand forever if Israel did not sin against him. Then actual time when the last servitude began was exactly 400 years following the completion of Solomon's temple. The 400 years, the completion of Solomon's temple, 1004, 400 years, 604, when the Nebuchadnezzar come. See, all this is, is it's not just something I'm throwing up here. This is in our textbook. Mm -hmm. All right, read. Yahweh Elohim had previously told Moses that he would visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the children of the fourth, of the third and fourth generation. Third and fourth generation. That's why the four hundred is up here. Okay, read. And if for all this they had not hearkened unto him, he would punish them seven times more, or seventy weeks times seven years, mm -hmm. in equivalent to four hundred ninety years. And this period of severitude to Nebuchadnezzar was the beginning of the seventh. And the last time in their own land, Canaan, okay. which led up to the beginning of the times of Gentiles. Times it said the seventh time, and why? Because they had been in servitude six previous times up here that you can read about in the book of Judges. Mm -hmm. We don't have time to explore all of that. Maybe another day. 
But see, the, the, they had been in servitude six times up here. That's why they had this, Yahweh sent judges to rescue them. Okay? But they had no king right. at this time. All right? But keep reading. The chronology of compilations can be observed in Yahweh Elohim had shown Moses by the vision of the creation that the sun was created on the fourth day in Psalms 94 mm -hmm. and 2 Peter 3 and 8. We read that one day with Yahweh as a thousand years, mm -hmm. a thousand years of one day relating to the sun, Yahshua Messiah, in manifesting the ethereal sun mm -hmm. shown Moses in Genesis. Okay, now I'll hold it right there. Now that's that's another way of short because the sun was placed on the fourth day, right? Mm -hmm. According to Moses' vision, so mm -hmm. Yah the S U N, so Yahshua fulfilling that S O N, it's got to come in on the four thousandth year. Okay, I did it by showing the watches because by showing the watches, it showed mankind being in darkness since mm -hmm. Adam. Okay, that's just one way to show that. Here's the other way. Well, the S-U-N was, was placed on the fourth day, according to Moses' vision. The fourth day, that's 4,000 years. Each day as a thousand. That will be 4,000 years. Yahshua coming in to fulfill that mm -hmm. in the 4,000th year. Okay? But continue. That the sun was placed in heaven on the fourth day, and Yahshua was born in the closing of the fourth millennium, mm -hmm. or 4,000 year after the creation. Hence, the times of Gentiles would be would be 25, 20 years, beginning with six, oh, 601 BY, All right, huh? and reached uh -huh. Keep going. to 1990 AD. To 1990, to 19 what? 19. 1919 AD. AD. 25, see, if we take 25, 20 years and add that to the times of the Gentile, it would take us to 1919 AD. All right, keep reading. This is a figure by showing one day for a year, or 360 times 7. Mm -hmm. The 2520. 360? Did we just have this on the board? 360 mm -hmm. times 7? Right. Which equals 2520. Mm -hmm. Anything I've been telling you is right in here in this textbook. If you take the time to look at it. But a lot of people don't want to. See, they, they, a lot of people want to invent things and show, oh, see, look by revelation. This is what I got new. A lot of people can't even explain the majority of the stuff in this textbook. Right. Especially in the fourth volume. Wow. See? But you want to show me something new. You can't even explain what's been established. <laughs> you want to show me something new. Oh, man, please. Read. Crazy. So 2520 years reached to 1990 AD. But the covenant must be confirmed with many for one week. Con confirmed with many for one week. See? Uh, one, how, how, how long is a week? Seven days. Seven days. So seven... Seven days, like seven years, mm -hmm. all right, and that and that what read? Or seven years, which would reach from 1919 to 1926 AD. AD. All right, 1926 AD, and it just leaves off there, right? right? That's the end of it. All right, now this is what I learned from one Peter Godot who wrote a paper once, oh, yeah. you know, about the mystery of Yahweh. See, and see, he showed that the five years. See, when you add five years to this. This would be 1931 A.D., which is the year of the vision. Why five years? Well, let's go back and look at the principle. See, we told you back here that Joshua, son of Nun, he appeared down here in Egypt. Right. And he appeared to be 30 years old, and he was there for 30 years. Now, when Joshua appeared down here in Egypt, Moses had already left. Moses had killed an Egyptian. And he had to flee for his life. Mm -hmm. So Joshua appeared down here in Egypt 10 years after Moses left. Mm -hmm. How old was Moses when he left Egypt? He was 40 years old. So if, so if he's 40 years old when he left, and Joshua's appearing 10 years afterward, that would make Moses out here in the wilderness 50 years old when Joshua appeared down here in Egypt. Okay? Yahshua the Messiah, we talked about, we had it read about Pentecost. Mm -hmm. The word Pentecost, let's look at the word Pentecost. The word Pentecost means, Pente, this is a Greek word. Mm -hmm. The word Pente means 50. 50. Right. Why? Because this day is 50 days from the resurrection. Why? Because when we talk about feasts, see, Yahshua's fulfilling John and Tittle. His death 
fulfilled the feast of the Passover. Right. His burial fulfilled the feast of unleavened bread. Because yeah. unleavened bread is no yeast. Yeah. Right. His resurrection fulfilled the feast of first fruits. And Pentecost here is a fulfillment of the Feast of Weeks because the Feast of Weeks, you see, in other words, you had these different seasons. The Feast of First Fruits, see, that was on Abib the 16th. And then 50 days later, because we, wait a minute, didn't we read about the Jubilee? Yeah. Right. See, and it was seven times seven. Well, see, look, it was 49, plus, it was 50 days from the Feast of First Fruits to the Feast of Weeks. See, or seven times seven plus one. See, it's the same thing in principle. It's just a wheel in the midst of a wheel. Okay? But, but this point, particular point is showing you that this vision, when Henry Clifford Kinley received this vision in 1931, this was 2520 coming to him. In other words, that was Yahweh Elohim in a body. Because of 2520. We showed 2520 back here with Joshua. It was 2513 a.m. when they left. Joshua went up the mountain with Moses, transfigured. Seven prophetic days, 2520. We showed you Joshua and Messiah. He fulfilled that when he took Peter, James, and John up this mount. Right. Mount of Transfiguration. That's 2520. That's a fulfillment of this right here. And now here's Dr. Kinley. He's coming along. 2520. See, the, here's the reason why I, I harp, I, I'm, I'm focusing on this. Because this vision represents, because see, what did Yahshua say? These things will happen until the times of the Gentiles, Gentiles be, fulfilled. be fulfilled. What does fulfill mean? Bring to an end. Means to complete, bring to an end, to be performed. See, till the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, from a physical standpoint, somebody could look at that and say, well, after 1931, the British Empire, mm -hmm. which controlled the middle parts, certain parts of the Middle East, opened up, well, particularly Palestine, because, see, in 19, I think it was in 1922, the, um, the League of Nations, you can look them up, they're, they're defunct now, but, but the League of Nations was a precursor right. to the United Nations. Right. And the League of Nations issued a Palestinian mandate to Great Britain, who was a great power at the time, like America is now. You know, great military, you know, great naval power. Great, it was an empire. Right. Crying out loud. Great Britain was the last colonial empire. Okay, all empires since then have been economic, but Great Britain was the last colonial empire. They had control of that of the Middle East, and they in turn opened up Palestine for Jews to come back home, okay? Mm -hmm. Which in turn in time led to the state of Israel being made, okay? Now some people can look at that and say, well, that's the time, you know, to the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled. But I would rather show you a more spiritual application to mm -hmm. this. Because Joshua said, till the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That simply means this, and let's get Romans 2 and 20, oh. So 28, uh, I went before that. But it's the second chapter of Romans I want for sure. I just, it's just a matter of when I wish, where I want to start at. Um, uh, start with 2, 25. For circumcision. Verily profit, profitless, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, why circumcision is made uncircumcision? Therefore, if the uncircumcision kept the righteousness of the law, thou shalt his uncircumcision... No, turn again. Okay, let me... Take your time. Therefore, huh? if the uncircumcision <laughs> keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision... Be for circumcision? Now, see, here's Paul making a very critical question. If the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, right. if they keep the spirit of the law, should they not be counted as circumcised? If they, if they be physically, you know, Gentiles, but they keep the spirit 
of the law, or spirit of law has come to death, shall they be not counted? Mm -hmm. See, keep reading. Shall not the uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and the circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outward. Now, see, now, if the uncircumcision keeps the spirit of the law, then he's not... He's not a Jew outwardly, right. because the Jews were the ones that were given these 613 ordinances. See? So he's not a Jew outwardly, and it's like it was fulfilled and done away with by Yahshua, and so now it's in the spirit now. But now if the Gentile keep the spirit of the law, mm -hmm. and he's uncircumcised, that means he's he's not a Jew on the outward, right. but read. But he, but neither is that circumcision, mm -hmm. which is outwardly in the flesh, mm -hmm. but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and the circumcision in that of the heart is a spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of Yahweh. Okay, keep going, see. What if, what if oh, no, that's good enough, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, you're ready, because he, he's not a Jew, and that's what we say. Over this way. Okay. He's not a Jew. Outwardly, but one inwardly. And that's what we are now. See, you look around, you know, wherever you're meeting at or whoever you're with, not everybody's a Jew. You know, you may have white people, black people, yellow people, red people. You know. uh, it's not about the outward. It's, right. it's, it's the inward, see. And see, the Jew, read the last two verses again. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Mm -hmm. right, right. Neither is that circumcision is... is which is outward in the flesh. Mm -hmm. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of Yahweh. All right, now, here's how this, let's wrap this up, because we're almost out of time. Yahshua said, till the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Okay? Right. So now, let's look at this. Here you are, because see, we're in this group, we're in this age of grace here. Right. Present kingdom age. Mm -hmm. See, we told you this, one other lesson. Abraham was given a promise that through his seed, all families of the earth would be blessed. And we got this line here. First to the Jews on Pentecost, seven years later to the Gentiles, okay? And see, we all become Jews inwardly. In other words, it's like this. Yahshua said, till the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, I say this to you. When you understand how Yahshua translates you into the kingdom of his dear son, in accordance to his purpose, plan, and pattern, see, then your time as a Gentile has been fulfilled or completed right. or brought to an end. And now... You're a spiritual Jew mm -hmm. right. in the kingdom. Hallelujah. You see that now? Yes. See, your time as a Gentile is now concluded. <laughs> see, in this age of Pentecost, and Pentecost is ongoing. It's see, going. yes. You're translated into the kingdom. You're not a Jew anymore. I mean, rather, you're not a Gentile anymore. <laughs> you're now a Jew, spiritually speaking. Your time as a Gentile has been fulfilled or brought to an end. Now you are translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Right, correct. See, and 2520 has now come to you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay? Thank you. And in, and in that, just as Yahweh Elohim moves from ages to ages, just as we've started off with the scripture lesson about his eternal power, the power of transmutation, you as well will be in, in that, in him. Going through the ages, yeah, I'll stand over here. Going through the ages, transmuting into ages to come. Right. You know, because there were ages before and there are ages to come. This age, this set of ages will come, will transmute out of existence, and we in Yahshua will transmute into existence a new set of ages. Right. And exactly. see, and see, and we in Him will be worshiping Him yeah. eternally. See, and there's no thing about, oh, well, I wish we were back here and, you know. Good old days. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> like we're going to have pictures. Yeah, remember when we were back in the flesh? Yeah, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. like, this, this, I'll be, you know, this will be a 
bygone. Right. You know, I said, oh, okay, yeah, we did that, but we're going on the greater and more right. glorious things, okay? Yeah. We're out of time. I hope, I, I hope I got out a, a, well, a lot of what I wanted to say as far as the greatest mystery ever perpetrated upon mankind, okay, which is Joshua the son of Nun, who truly was Joshua the Messiah, instituting and Yahshua the Messiah came along and fulfilled. Our founder, who was the seventh angel, right. he's not here to contend with what Moses wrote or what John wrote, but to confirm everything that they wrote as well as what the scriptures wrote. Okay? Thank you very much for your time and your patience. Uh, be safe, be healthy, but, but most of all, be in, be in Yahshua the Messiah because he truly is your only hope of glory. And with those few words, hallelujah. Hallelujah. All righty. That concludes today's lectures. And uh, I'll keep you appraised of what's going to be going on for the future uh, uh, classes, okay? Right. So hang in there. And... Uh, yeah, we'll come through. Oh, yeah. Okay, now uh, let's all stand and be dismissed. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless with his presence with exceeding joy. To the only ones out of him our Savior, to Yahshua the Messiah Sovereign, belong glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both for all time, now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, Dr. Kelly, in 1931, that was the time, the end of his uh, days in Gentile. Yep. Yeah. Times of the Gentiles, man. Ended. It's over. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, so it's, uh, thank you, thank you. That was